Now, this is the thing about taking action. I'm going to give you a couple terms that everybody puts out there, but I'm going to describe them again because, honestly, every time somebody says they already know this to me and then they tell me what their goals are, they don't actually know how to do this. Invariably, they've given me goals that don't work. So we're going to talk about SMART goals and actionable steps really quickly. Uh, SMART goals are this. It's been going on for decades now. They're specific. They're not vague. I love when somebody says, okay, what is your goal as an embroiderer? I just want to be the best, man. Be the best. Okay. Most profitable, best at technical embroidery, well known. What's the thing that's making you the best? It's not specific. It's too vague. It's not enough. Uh, measurable. How are we going to measure best? Like I said, what are we going to measure what it is? Uh, attainable. Especially when you're just starting out. Be the best top embroiderer in the world might not be the first goal you want to hit. Great to keep in your mind. Great to shoot for the stars. But the first thing you want to take action on is probably going to be a little closer to home. Uh, relevant. The other thing I love is I, I talk to people like, what do you want to do with your business? They go, sit on the beach all day and do nothing. Well, it's not really relevant to the goal of your business. You're going to have to build a heck of a business and hire some real good people if you want to do that. I know people who do it, but it takes them a while. They're 10 years in and they're just starting to sniff at it. <laughs> if it's relevant, it needs to go to the goal that you have overall and be something that actually aims toward it. And time-based, I think you should always set a time. It's not that you can't miss that and come back to it, but having it be time-based just gives you an idea of when you should say, okay, am I hitting my goal or not? If I can evaluate this right now, where are we at? The next thing is actionable steps. And this is one I can't believe I have to define, but when I talk to folks online especially, there's a lot of people who don't get this. An actionable step is, of course, something you can do. It's not just a goal. You have to be able to take a direct action to achieve it. Something you or your crew can do in service of your goal. It has to be an action. There's got to be a verb involved. So that's an actionable step. It's not be the best. Yes, there's a verb there technically, but be the best isn't a thing. Uh, go to a class is. So this is where how I define that. Let's say that we're just starting out, but we don't know 3D foam. OK, here's my goal, smart goal. I want to be able to sell 3D foam by February 15th. So what do we have here? Sell 3D foam. It's something I want to be able to do, so that's very specific. Uh, I want to do it by February 15th. There's your time, right? It's attainable. I already know how to do embroidery, but I'm not really sure about doing 3D foam or selling it. So that's something that's in my channel and works. Also, I'm an embroidery company, so it's relevant, obviously. And I've thought about my tribe. My thri tribe keeps telling me, I want those cool 3D foam hats that have the really tall crown 3D foam. Looks great, dimensional. And you're like, all right, tribe wants it. People want it. I need to figure out how to do it. That's relevant. So actionable steps, though. This isn't an actionable step. I mean, yes, you know some stuff that has to be done. Actionable steps. Attend a seminar to learn more about it. Source foam from your vendor. Run samples so you have samples to sell from and so you have some experience on running the stuff. List it on the store site and then promote it in your marketing. Those are actionable steps, things you can actually do and take uh, action on. And some of these, of course, are going to have sub-actions that come up. You go to do it and say, I don't know how to do the marketing for 3D foam. <laughs> You're like, okay, well, get images made. Contact the you know, people who do the marketing or look up how you buy a Facebook ad. Whatever it is, you can break it down to sub-steps over and over again, but until you have an action to take, a goal is not very real. So this is the thing I always tell everybody. Whenever they're afraid to take their first step, you can't steer a parked car. You need to take some steps to get where you're going. Now, don't get me wrong. Without the foundation, without the direction, if you don't have a, some sort of guidepost to say, this is where I'm headed, you can't move anyway. So you do need to plan, but there comes a point where all the planning in the world is not going to get you there. And you're never going to know if the plan's going to work until you start. So you can't steer a parked car. Honestly, better off to start moving in your direction, especially when the other directions you go are relevant. If you're just saying, I want to be an embroidery business for this kind of category, and you change categories, all the stuff in the I want to be an embroidery business side of it that help you be better at embroidery and business, doesn't change too, too much when you change your direction of what your tribe is that you're working for. So you can't steer a parked car. Go ahead and go. It's OK to change your mind. And change your mind quickly is not a weakness. It's a strength. Holding on too long when something's not working is actually a little worse. So don't feel bad about changing your mind, but you can't steer a parked car. So let's talk about common operational problems for new pros. Some of this stuff, I'm going to do a little survey, raise of hands to see if we actually need to talk about it. Because I think some of you guys out here, most of you guys, aren't going to have the same problems that uh, some of my people when I was uh, workshopping this said they had. So in general, we were going to talk about equipment and upgrading, dealing with digitizing, and then first steps in marketing. But this is the first thing I'm going to ask. Uh, who out here is still like on a single head machine? Are you guys on single head embroidery machines? OK, cool. Anybody still on a single needle home machine? 
when you're evaluating a machine, no matter what machine it is, or if you're trying to expand, and this also, by the way, if you're adding something new, if you're adding heat press, you're adding DTG, adding something else, same kind of categories make sense. Um, when you're evaluating any machine, whether it's your own or something you want to buy, capability is first. What can it do? Does it add to our capability? Or is my existing machine doing all the things I need it to do? You know, does my machine run 3D foam hats, for instance, very well? Or do I need something for that? Ease of use. Do the features that it has, does it make it easier for me to use? Does it take less time for me to work on? Or is it taking more time? Is it difficult for me to use? Lastly, throughput. How fast does it run? How well does it run quickly? And is it set up for production in such a way that allows me to keep on moving material through at this rate I need to with the time I need to? I know I sometimes tell people this, like when they're running uh, home machines, especially that are rather slow, that sometimes if you're, on a, if you're on your side gig and you only have a couple hours a day and you have a very slow machine, you have a very limited amount of output that you can do. Doesn't mean you can't do something with it, but it changes your margins, it changes your overhead because you just can't put out the amount of work that somebody with a faster machine can. Doesn't mean you can't make it work. It does mean you have to look at pricing and see if there's some other way you can sell value because you can't make it do what a commercial machine can do. So here are the types of machines. We already know most about home machines. The things that are hard about home machines, flat bed, you got to roll stuff out of the way. It's not great for tubular goods. Um, can they do good embroidery? Absolutely. Here's a, a sample that is a five color gradient. Good digitizing, good execution. Absolutely, you can make beautiful embroidery on a home machine. They're slow. They're hard to hoop on and they tend not to wear well over time. So these little machines, especially the cheaper ones, um, you can start on them, not really great for commercial, uh, I think personally for commercial business overall. Have I seen people make commercial businesses out of them? Absolutely. I've seen people make it happen, especially with the right margins. I find uh, little rectangular hoops don't hold real well and they have some other drawbacks. Prosumer machines, this is the category that gets people very confused, but also it gets commercial people very confused, including myself. The first time I worked on a modern, recent prosumer machine, the thing that made me amazed is they have a lot of what I call training wheels. If you have a commercial machine, especially an old school commercial machine, you may have dinged a hoop with your foot, broken a reciprocator, bent a needle bar. You can't do that with these because they know what hoop is on them. So sometimes these prosumer machines are great for some people, and especially if you do mobile embroidery, People who do mobile embroidery, monogramming on site, name drops on site, working in, in stores, I've seen them actually prefer these because they're easy to plug in, don't need weird power, sit on a tabletop, and are light to carry. This can be a model for you. And honestly, there's some reasons why. Though they are a little slower, they usually have a smaller sewing field, so they have some drawbacks as well. But for certain reasons, people may really like these. So prosumer machine, not the worst. Also, service, sometimes you can take these back to a sewing vac shop and have it shipped back to the maker of the machine quite quickly. And so some people will choose these for the service, especially if they're in an area where techs can't get to without a great deal of expense. Uh, commercial machines, obviously commercial machines are very capable. They have the best capability. And frankly, the biggest thing I find with these is people who need to do 3D structured hats very often need to have commercial machines if they really want to make it work, because it's a lot to ask out of a prosumer level machine. Truthfully, can, I, can you do it on prosumer? I've seen it, but this is the way to go if you're doing that kind of heavy work or heavy tack, people who do stuff for uh, equestrian sports, they end up working on really heavy things that I think commercial machine makes a lot of sense to drive that big pantograph with those things attached. So really, it's about capability, it's about speed. They tend to be faster, a little heavier built, but they also tend to have a lot of costs in them. Uh, in the course of upkeep and techs coming out to do repairs, we're going to talk about. How do you differentiate between machines? If you're trying to buy a machine, whether this is new, used, whatever, how are you going to differentiate between the machines? Um, if they are all equal in capability and throughput for you, or at least it's not that different depending on the machine, it's about support and repair, right? First, official support. How much am I going to get support from the company? Are they going to train? Do they have enough material out there? Do they have videos out there? Is there support available when I have a problem? Official support is a big deal. Second thing, community support. I think community support is huge. If you have a vibrant user community, it can almost make up entirely sometimes for official support being not that great. I don't love that idea, but I have seen people make hay in a, with a machine that has great community support and not the best official support. These are people who are up late doing the same thing you do, who have encountered problems themselves that you have, not in a lab, not 20 years ago, but they're doing it right now. So sometimes community support can be pretty important. I like to see a vibrant user community whenever I can. Uh, repair, this is a big one. Technician and parts availability, about, <clears throat> availability. Especially if you are looking at a used machine. 
find out from someone who knows whether there are still parts available, especially electronics, because once the board fries on something that's old enough, the price of getting that repaired or the difficulty in finding a board can be a big deal. Once you get into full production, you rely on this machine, having it down for weeks while you're trying to find parts, or in the case of the technicians, waiting for a technician to get out to you, paying for a technician to fly to your location can be a big deal. So find out, especially you're about to buy a machine new, kind of tack them down and say, okay, where are your techs? Who do you know? This is my location. How do I get somebody out and what, that, what is that gonna cost me? Do you have a service sweep that goes through my area? What does maintenance look like? What does it look like if I break something serious? So ultimately, total cost of ownership is a big deal. How is it gonna run for you? What is it capable of? And total cost of ownership, what's gonna happen when I have to repair it? Because you will eventually have to repair it. How is that gonna look? What am I gonna do when that happens? What does that cost look like? So, this is the other thing. A lot of people who come from the craft who really love what they're doing uh, want to expand for reasons that may not be the most commercial. Uh, sometimes we look at a brand new toy, a laser, a printer, the color reel, something like that, and go, that looks really awesome. I want to make that work. But it's a creative desire and it's not an opportunity. So, this is the real thing. Don't purchase equipment without a solid idea how or to whom you'll sell what it produces. I can't tell you how many shops I've gone into to talk to somebody where they have a printer that is covered in a felt-like layer of dust because they thought they were gonna get into sublimation and they never did it. And also, if you've already bought the thing, put out some work, make it pay for itself. Like work that thing and get some money out of it. Or if you find out it's not worth it, sell it and get it out of your life and go back to your core that you do well. But don't purchase equipment without a solid idea how or to whom you will sell it. Why? Why do I say this? I know very well. The shop I worked in had a million little failed experiments all around the outside edge because those guys didn't really think that way. We had embossers and printers and wide format and a bumper sticker press. Each one of them had seasons that we made them work, but a lot of them could have just never come into the shop and it would have been a massive savings. I'm not saying don't follow your dream, don't do what you want to do, but know when something is a hobby and know when it's professional. Uh, ultimately, I'll just go ahead and say, you know, my name is Eric and I make stuff that looks cool that doesn't make money. Yeah, we, <laughs> we've all done it. It's okay that that happens. It's all okay to choose that. Don't do it all the time and don't show everybody that stuff with the expectation you're gonna keep doing it. So, do I need it? Does the desired equipment solve an existing problem we're already having? Open up a new market that we can sell into or increase the, the value of the product I'm giving out? If it doesn't do these things, or if it doesn't solve a problem for your customer, uh, you probably don't need it. Or at least you should think really hard before you expand on how you will make a need through marketing. So, can it pay for itself and produce profit? If not, probably not your thing.